Today I'd like to share with you um, the story of the development of the first uh, digital camera, which took place in a, a small applications laboratory at Eastman Kodak Company in Rochester, New York in 1975. And, um, by doing that, I, I hope to share with you some of the learnings that I've had or, uh, on uh, how to develop uh, disruptive technology inside of a corporate environment. <laughs> and, um, and also share with you, you know, give you some insight into the uh, contribution made by the Eastman Kodak Company, the film company, to the development of digital photography in general. Now, um, this small project resulted in a handheld, completely digital camera that recorded images to a removable medium, and then a playback system to display it on a television set. Now, there were many, um, there were many uh, demonstrations of this system uh, throughout the year 1976 inside the corporation uh, to various executives, but there was no public acknowledgement of any of this work that I'm about to tell you uh, until the year 2001. And um, there was a, a technical report written uh, about this. That was uh, traditional, typically what you did do at the end of a, of a research project. And uh, I wrote uh, this technical report, a portion of which is up on the screen right now. And I wrote this in 1976, and it was my attempt at trying to sketch out what might actually happen in the future uh, with uh, starting off with something like what we were demonstrating back then. Now this is a really big place, so I would say that if half the people in the first row here read this, we will double the number that have done so over the last 30 years. <laughs> Technical reports are not the way to get the word out. Let me tell you how it started. Um, you know, innovation, product innovation, I look at it as like a roll of dominoes. Uh, the domino that started this off was the development of the charge couple device. In 1969, Boyle and Smith and Bell Labs developed a new type of device that would allow for solid state imaging. That is a solid chip that would enable you to capture an image and, and read it out electronically. And although they were invented in 69, the first commercial devices only became available in 1974. And so I had a brief discussion with my supervisor, Gareth Lloyd, in the research labs, where we uh, discussed a small project where I might take a look at this to see if there was any application for this in our research labs. We, we looked at products. We also looked at metrology applications for manufacture. So we thought maybe there was an application for this. And the discussion um, really took probably about 45 seconds. And, um, which was good, because I really had no specific technical goals. And so, consequently, I thought about it, and I said, well, if you want to look at this as an imager and imaging application, wouldn't it be nice to um, uh, basically come up with something where I would build a portable device that is a camera device to somehow capture images in some crude way so that we could evaluate them. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to do that, I might want to display them because I had no way to print them, of course, so maybe display them electronically as well. And since I was a newly minted electrical engineer, surrounded by mechanical engineers, I thought I'd try to build it with absolutely no moving parts. <laughs> the last one was just me. I, I, uh... So let me tell you a little bit about the device. This here is a picture of the device. It's a, it was a, a little integrated circuit chip. Uh, they were very uh, experimental. Uh, this was made by Fairchild Corporation. It had 10,000 pixels, so in today's parlance it was 0.01 megapixel. Okay? Um, it had a certain architecture that lent itself to video applications, and it had an active area that was small enough for me to utilize in existing optical assemblies. But the thing to note about this is, is that it was very, very difficult to work with. This was very early in this technology, such that when you ordered it, I got this chip and it came in a plastic uh, box, and when you open up the box, on top of the actual device was folded a piece of paper, and on that piece of paper were 12 voltage designations that were printed out, and next to each one, handwritten in pencil, was the voltage that this particular device worked on 
on the manufacturing line. And at the bottom said, good luck. <laughs> and the reason was, was because if any one of those voltages wasn't quite correct, you got no output, and it was up to you to figure out what was wrong. Now, the approach I decided to take was an all digital implementation. Now, I would love to tell you I had the foresight to, to say that I knew that the world was going to go that much digital, but the real fact is, is that my training had been in digital and that I couldn't begin to cope with the mechanical complexities of a more conventional approach, which would have been more of like a helical scan type of a, of a device for VCRs that were just coming out at the time. So I decided to take this all digital approach for that reason. And I wanted to construct a camera that really had um, a parallel to existing cameras. So I wanted to make this camera so that it would have a removable type of storage for the, for the uh, captured image, much like film cameras were. And then I thought I wanted to view the images electronically as well, again, because I had no way to print them. Once I had these images, the only way to see them was electronically. So I was going to do that as well. So I had to build a special playback device. So when we talk about this project, most people like to talk about the camera, but over half the work in this was to build this specialized playback device, because there really were no use usable platforms for that at the time, because there were no personal computers out at that time either. Now, I must tell you, I had no idea how to do any of this when we started. But the good news was is that I was surrounded by the most talented group of technical people involved with imaging anywhere, the people at Eastman Kodak Company, knew everything, and so you were only a five-digit extension away from any expert in any area of imaging. And I made good use of that. I would come up with really weird problems, and these people would help me out with them. So to some extent, this is really the product of the Eastman Kodak Company. Now, let me tell you about the situation. <laughs> there are all kinds of projects in a research lab. You know, there's big projects, small projects, and then what I call filler projects. Those are those projects that you do just to keep yourself from getting in trouble. And uh, so that's what this was. It was a very, very small project. Um, so there was no real formal management review process involved here. In fact, I barely spoke to my supervisor about it for the duration. So it was really quite small. Um, we had no real help on this. It was just me and then part-time work of two really talented technicians, Bob Dieger and Jim Schickler. Um, and a large portion of the success we may have had with this project was due to their imagination and diligence. So the th three of us, or two and a half of us, uh, used to work on this for about a year. We had no budget, okay, which meant that I could buy the CCD because that was sort of the excuse for me going back there. But other than that, I couldn't put in any POs for anything of any substance whatsoever. So, and then the last was we had no space. You know, small projects don't demand much importance. So we literally, and this is true, I'm not making this up, this was really done in a back lab. We actually cleaned out a back lab, cleaned out all the junk that was in there because nobody wanted to use it. It was way at the back of a long hallway. And that's where we first built this system. So in summary, our plan was unrealistic. No one was paying attention. We had no money and we, nobody knew where we were working. So. In summary, the situation was just about perfect. <laughs> now, a, pro a digital camera requires imaging optics. Couldn't afford to build optics, but fortunately, I was just upstairs from a manufacturing line for the XL movie camera line, film movie cameras. And it so happened that the aperture for the CCD could fit into the aperture plane of this film camera. I went downstairs, and I stole an optical assembly from the used parts bin. These are the broken cameras. And that's what we use for the optics. The imager assembly had to be the CCD that you saw before, plus the electronics necessary to drive it. And they had to be tucked up inside behind the imaging plane. We had to convert right away to digital words. And now that requires something called an A to D converter, which is quite common today. But back then, they existed, but they were very expensive and they were very large. Fortunately, we were just at that point in technology development where 
Digital was applying itself to metrology, specifically voltage meters. And so there was a certain technique that could be used called successive approximation that we used on this, and it only required a couple of chips by, by Motorola. So I, that plus an application note I found enabled me to build a very low cost pipeline type of A to D converter that would fit in the camera. We had to store this all in memory. The biggest memory chips that were available were 4,096 bit chips. So we needed a bunch of those, and those had to be supplied. So that had to hold the image while uh, we were getting ready to store it on its permanent storage. And the permanent removable storage, the only one that was viable at the time, was digital cassette tape. So that's what we used. Now, let's talk about the imaging chain really briefly. How does a digital camera work? Well, what happens is the light has to come in and Im make an exposure on the active area of the CCD. And once you get that active area exposed, after a certain period of time, you get a, a digital a readout, an analog readout. It's a, just a voltage waveform that looks a lot like this. It's stepped. And as you go from pixel 1 to pixel 2 to pixel 3 across a row, you get different voltage levels. And so that's what happened. And they went to the A to D converter. And from there, it was converted to a 4-bit word. So there's four, four bits, or 16 gray levels. This was only black and white. And it was stored into the digital memory card. Now, this process took about 50 milliseconds. And one of the things to realize is that charge coupled devices are wonderful devices for imaging, but they can't store anything, much like film can. So what you have to do is capture it, and then convert it, and then store it in the digital memory. So that was 1 20th of a second uh, for, for, for capture. So exposure was reasonable. And then from that point, it was read out rather slowly over 23 seconds to the storage device. So it took 23 seconds to empty that memory and be ready for another, to take another picture. Here's what resulted after about a, a year's worth of work. Now, this is a definition of beauty is in the eyes of the holder. I called it my baby. It made me cry a lot. Um, here's some of the specifications. About the size of a toaster, weighs about what a toaster is. Required 16 AA batteries to function. The digital cassette was on the side. How I got that, by the way, was uh, uh, there was a, a well logging application where they, they actually, when they drilled wells, they recorded digital data in that. And uh, I took that and could fit that in my camera because it would run off at of 12 volts. Uh, I could have chosen any number of pictures to put on that tape. I chose 30, a number conveniently between 24 and 36. The uh, movie camera uh, optics I mentioned before. And then the thing I want to mention here is this is how the camera is pictured today. But it was really foldable. It had to be. So this is how I remember the camera. The whole thing unfolded, and this is how we worked on it. And so anytime we made modifications or corrections, it would, had to be unfolded, and we'd work on it. And it would work and take pictures in this, in this uh, situation or this uh, modality. Now, uh, here's the memory card. This is probably the first digital memory card for cameras. It was wired by Bob Dieger, and yes, he did need new glasses when he was done with this. <laughs> um, but there were 12 4,096-bit chips that would hold the 40,000, 10,000 times 4 bits, 40,000 bits that represented a picture. And then I just want to show you this is a demonstration. This is one of the boards that was in there. We just built thing on top of thing on top of thing. There was no chance to like test out a circuit and then build it right inside the camera. We only had one chance to build it. We built it in there. If it didn't work, we ripped it out and tried it again. So it wasn't very pretty inside. So this is the camera. And I have brought it with me here today to Chautauqua. I love doing this. <laughs> Unveil it here. So if any of you have a digital camera, regardless of manufacturer, if after the talk you'd like to bring it up, you could introduce it to its great-great-great-grandfather. 